Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Laura Jane Grace thought she knew how 2020 was going to go. Her punk band, Against Me, started practicing. They were working out new songs with designs to make a new record eventually. They were going to go on tour in March. And of course, those things didn't happen. The tour lasted three days before it got canceled. The band can't meet up to rehearse. But there were still these songs. So Grace pulled out her guitar and made a solo record. She called it Stay Alive. Not like that kind of thing matters, but Stay Alive isn't especially punk in its aesthetic. Maybe more like the Mountain Goats or Neutral Milk Hotel. It's an album from a singer who is confident enough to let her writing speak for itself. There's usually just an acoustic guitar, sometimes a drum machine, and Laura's voice. Powerful, passionate, and vulnerable. On Bullseye, she's being interviewed by my pal, co-host, and against me, superfan Jordan Morris. Let's kick things off with something from Laura's new record. This one's called The Swimming Pool Song. I am a haunted swimming pool. I am emptied out and drained. My capacity remains unchanged. I am a haunted swimming pool. I am emptied out and drained. My capacity remains unchanged. Laura Jane Grace, welcome to Bullseye. Thank you very much for having me. So you got your start playing music in the music scene in Gainesville, Florida, which is kind of a legendary music scene in its own way. Yeah, what's Gainesville like for somebody who's never been there, and uh, why do you think so much good music comes from there? Well, technically, I started out in southwest Florida, in Naples, Florida, and there is no music scene whatsoever (laughs) in Naples, Florida. And um, very much so, like my early teenage years, you know, once I got into music and once I realized that there was really no place for me in southwest Florida, very much the thought of getting out of Florida predominated my mindset. And so, you know, if you're at the bottom of Florida, there's only one way to go to get out unless you want to swim, and that is to head north. (laughs) And so, you know, I moved out of my mom's house when I was 18 years old. I did not go to college. I, I dropped out of high school my sophomore year. But for most of my friends, you know, when once you're turning 18 and it's time to move out. The good majority of my friends were going to college, you know, and uh, for most of my friends, it was either a choice between Tallahassee or Gainesville. But between the two college towns in Florida, Gainesville has always had just like such a more vibrant music scene happening. It just felt like that's where everything was going on in Florida. And I'm not sure what started it that way, but it definitely like predated me going there. And you know, there was, there was real venues in Gainesville. There was like real record labels and there were real bands that were national touring acts. And there was, you know, there was like history there connected to music too, even with like, that's where Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers were from. That's, you know, like it, there, there was, um, in the punk scene, it was really happening at the time. That's where like hot water music was, was from. And they were really going off at the time. And then also, um, you know, the band less than Jake, like they were, signed to a major label, real touring bands. So that's where, that's where I wanted to be. And there was also, um, you know, in addition to the music scene, there was an activist scene happening there. And I wanted to be a part of that too. Do you remember the first time you ever heard um, punk rock music? Well, I guess, you know, you could go down the rabbit hole of arguing what is and isn't punk. Um, but but <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll take that to Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, but, you know, I, I guess predating um, my first auditory experience, I remember specifically being like eight years old 
in Italy and seeing the band name the Sex Pistols spray painted on a wall and knowing knowing that it was a band and knowing that there was something inherently different about what was going on with them and that they were somehow more dangerous than other things that I was listening to. But my overall musical gateway into punk was through other bands that were influenced by punk and those influences, which were which were demonstrated by them weren't necessarily understood by me. Like for instance, I loved guns and roses when I was in the third grade. That was like my first band. I really, really, really super connected with. And I started wearing a Sid vicious, like a uh, lock and chain collar because Duff McKagan wore one, not because I knew who Sid vicious was, you know? So like, and then years later found out the connection there. So all of my, my uh, intro to punk rock came through, through other bands in those ways. I want to talk about, you know, going from, you know, seeing music and being a music fan to actually playing it yourself. And I read that one of the first groups that you played with was people from your church youth group. I would love to hear about that experience and what kinds of music you were playing. When I moved to South Florida, uh, my parents divorced. My father stayed in Italy, and I moved with my mother and my younger brother. We moved to South Florida because my grandmother already lived there, as well as my aunt and uncle. And my aunt and uncle uh, attended a Presbyterian church. And so my mother started bringing my brother and I to the Presbyterian church. We weren't a super religious family. I think really what it comes down to is my mom was like looking for the social aspect of it, trying to meet people in an, in a new place, you know? So my mother would go and do whatever the adults were doing. And, and me and my brother had to be a part of the youth groups. And then in addition to like whatever was going on on Sundays, the youth group there at the Presbyterian church offered a Wednesday after class, um, you know, uh, a youth group, whatever. Um, so I, I think again, you know, my mother had to work late and she would send me and my brother to youth group. It was right across the street from our, my middle school. That's where my first group of friends I developed in South Florida were through the youth group. And there was two kids in particular, my friend RJ and my friend Nick, they were, they were brothers who, um, RJ played guitar and Nick was a drummer. And, we just really connected. We were both into the same type of music at the time, specifically like we were hugely influenced by Nirvana and Pearl Jam. And, you know, we loved Nirvana and Pearl Jam. And then we also were really into like classic rock bands like Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and The Doors and The Grateful Dead. And so we, you know, we would talk all the time about starting our own bands because like youth group for us was nothing about uh, God or about religion. It was just a chance to hang out for us to the point where we would get into a lot of trouble, but there was music involved in it too. You know, we were singing in choir, we were playing in bell choir, but we would talk about starting our own bands and there was a once a year talent show. So our first, first submission into the talent show, there was a group of like five or six of us and we did an acapella version of Bohemian Rhapsody, which I'm <laughs> so thankful there is no videotape evidence of. <laughs> We were like sitting backwards in chairs with backwards hats on. And, you know, it's... <laughs> was yeah. it an homage to Wayne's World? Was that <laughs> was that the... I'm sure it was, yes, because that yeah. was right around when Wayne's World came out. And that was my introduction to Queen, I'm sure of it, you know? <laughs> and then the second year we did, like, at that point we had actually... Um, RJ and Nick's parents would let us play music out at their house, which was in the Golden Gate Estates, which is kind of like removed from Naples out in, out in the woods. But uh, they would let us practice there. And so we had put our band together. And that second talent show, we we played like, you know, electric guitars, amplified drummer. Uh, we did a cover of John Lennon's Imagine. And then the third year, we did a cover of Heart Shaped Box, Nirvana. And that was when they asked us to never play at the talent show again. <laughs> I want to talk about the early days of uh, your band Against Me. I, I read that it started out with just you playing an acoustic guitar. And Against Me is like, is very punk, but typically, you know, punk rock bands have electrified instruments. Um, what was the reason for starting it out acoustic? Was it an artistic choice or just, you know, amps are expensive? A little bit of both. You know, after after that first initial band collapsed, I drifted heavily into punk. And that was in, and you know, my friends RJ and Nick, they kind of stayed in the grunge world. My first punk bands were all very like, uh, let's say like 77 style punk, very nihilistic, very much about live fast, die young, 
it, it was very linear, let's say, and, and what you would listen to and think, oh, that's punk. And then probably when I was like, I, I had like a political awakening, let's say around like 15 or 16 years old after I got arrested and beat up by the cops. And at that point, point I really split and got into like a section of punk rock or a subgenre of punk, like the anarcho punk movement. And I got really into the UK peace punk bands and the scene that was happening in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the time. So bands like from the UK, like Crass and Omega Tribe, The Mob, Zounds, Poison Girls, really early Chumbawamba, and then specifically also this band called The Apostles. And a lot of those bands had a really hippie sound. Like they, 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 were, they would have slogans like punk is hippie, hippie is punk. You know, it, there would be a lot of acoustic guitars in it. And so prior to that, I had always actually been the bass player in, in, band, in my punk bands. And I was playing in a band at the time called Common Affliction. And we were like a grindcore band, similar, again, to the, the Minneapolis scene bands I was listening to, like Doom and Destroy, and Code 13, um, and Civil Disobedience. And, and so we were much more like that. And that all felt very reliant on being in a band. And, you know, we were, we were, we were young, you know, like there was egos, whatever, like, and for whatever reason, it just wasn't it wasn't happening that much. And, and some of us were serious about it being like, you, I, I wanted it to be like, this is the rest of my life. You know, like I'm going to be in a band. We, we need to take this on tour. We need to do this. And other people were, you know, no fault to them or anything, but other people were more about like, let's just play music once a week and see what happens, you know? And so we kind of had like a falling out at some point or whatever, not that we broke up, but I was like, I want to do my own thing. Like, I, I feel like I, I just need to like, try something else. And so without any real intention, it was like maybe October or something like that. I was like, by December, I want to write 10 songs on my acoustic guitar and I want to record them on my mother had gotten me like a four track cassette tape recorder and I want to record them on a demo. And then I'll just dub some copies because that's how we would distribute music. Then we would record it on cassette and then just make copies of the cassette. We'd go to Kinko's, we'd scam copies of like an insert to put in the cassette and then give them away or whatever. So I just, you know, wanted to make like a dozen cassette tapes and then give them out to friends. And so I did it. And that was the very first Against Me record. The first time somebody played Against Me for for me, there was kind of a a, a legend surrounding the album like i think the spiel i got was like you have to hear this band it's just one person and they only play in laundromats <laughs> and i just wanted to ask is is that is that true was there a time when you were just playing laundromats and if not if that's just a weird urban legend do you remember your first shows with against me i well we played one laundromat that started that that legend. <laughs> um, maybe we did play subsequent laundromats, but it was really this one legendary laundromat show that uh, that was all born from. But, you know, we really like we didn't fit in anywhere as a band. And so starting out in Southwest Florida, as I said, where at first there was no place to play, you know, we would busk on street corners or or we would like um you know, we, we got really into the activist scene and really into being part of uh, Food Not Bombs and what was called FRAN, the Florida Radical Activist Networks, where, where a bunch of people who did Food Not Bombs in their different towns, we'd meet up once a month and talk about what we were doing. And then we'd organize things like youth liberation conference, conferences or May Day gatherings. And so we'd like go and camp in the middle of the Ocala National Forest for a week. And, you know, me and Kevin, who was the original drummer and against me, he would bring his pickle buckets and I would bring my acoustic guitar. And I saw that as like the advantage too then of the acoustic guitar. I was like, oh, we don't need amplifiers. If we, if we can't have a venue to play it, let's just take that a step further and like disown it and be like, well, we're not only are we not going to want to play on a stage, we're not even going to use amps. And that'll like give us an, an independence and a, an ability to adapt where all these other bands that are existing in South Fl Florida bemoaning the fact that they don't have a venue to play like we'll have an edge over them in this way. But there was a, a record store in South Florida called Higher Learning that was probably like our first place that we played the most shows at, but it was all very just like the local friends. And then when we moved to Gainesville, we really weren't accepted by the scene there at first at all. And the place that we played at was the Civic Media Center, which was a, a local nonprofit volunteer run anti-corporate press library and activist space. 
And so I started volunteering there and eventually like they let me start booking shows there even, but that was where against me would play all the time. And we weren't accepted in the bar scene. We weren't even accepted in the house show scene in Gainesville. And it, it t wasn't until a number of years later when we put out a record with no idea records with, which was like the local label of lore that, uh, that, that happened. But our first show, our first tours were all, you know, self-booked, uh, specifically leaning on a resource called book your own life, which was this zine that just had like a list of phone numbers and a list of addresses for houses or basements or show spaces across America. And I would call them up or write them a letter and send them a tape and be like, can we play? And so we did two tours like that, where it was like month long tours that, you know, starting out, go on the road and there's 30 shows booked, but at the end of it, we've maybe played a dozen each time. And, you know, we played anywhere, anywhere I would have us. So yeah, you uh, your first few albums uh, you mentioned came out on indie labels. Uh, you mentioned No Idea Records, and uh, you made a few for Fat Records. But then you made a couple of albums with Butch Vig, who produced Nirvana's Nevermind. Um, what does someone with that kind of experience bring to the table? And did and did making records with him feel more big time in a way that the other records didn't? Well, we got really, really, really lucky with working with Butch for a number of reasons. And, you know, we the, the record we made prior to New Wave, which was our first record with Butch, we made with Jay Robbins, who is a great producer in his own right. And that was our first experience with a producer. But the kind of classic uh, way it works when you're in a punk band and you start working with producers is that you'll be like, I want to work with a producer and then you'll get in the studio with a producer and you will do nothing but battle that producer and refuse <laughs> to cooperate or do anything they say, you know, cause you're punk and you, you, you want sure. your independence, you know, you don't <laughs> want anyone messing with your sound. So like Butch immediately just had this ability to kind of disarm all that. And it really like, um, just spoke to him being genuine, you know, like, when the conversation came up after, okay, we signed to a major label, A&R person brings up, you know, like, okay, what producer do you want to work with? And there's the immediate list of these, the biggest names in music that you've ever heard of that you're thinking like, yeah, right, none of these people want to work with us. And then you you get one that does want to work with you. Like, what could have happened was that one who did want to work with you could have just totally phoned it in and could have put you through their usual mold of what they do with every band and not really paid that much attention and had a dozen other projects going on at the same time. But Butch wasn't like that at all. He was all in there every day at the studio, every day during pre-production and really you know, devoted himself to understanding what the band was about, to understanding where our limitations were, where we could be pushed to grow and to doing it in a way where we were able to hold on to our identity and successfully placed himself as a buffer between us and the record label to protect us, which I'll be forever grateful for. And at the same time, also really giving us the chance to learn in the studio, like this is what this gear does. Like, hey, you you all signed a major label deal, deal and you're making a million dollar record in a studio right now and you're going to spend three months here. You should get, you should really get something out of this be, beyond your record. You should get some experience that you could use for the rest of your life. And that wasn't necessarily something that was spoken. It wasn't until afterwards that was realized, but I'm so thankful for it. Take some time to think, figure out what's important. You mentioned having a producer that kind of acts as a buffer between, you know, you and the label. Obviously, you know, the music industry has changed a ton since you've been in it. Do you feel like record labels, you know, try and influence music in the same way that they did, you know, when you were first starting out? 
ultimately, that was the realization I had that kind of tipped me towards the decision of signing to a major label was, you know, you, you're coming up when I came up, you're, you're kind of instilled with this fear of like, oh, the major label, they're going to try and change your sound. You're going to sign this contract and take this money and then you're selling your soul. But I realized like through the course of the first three Against Me records working with indies, a contract doesn't change anything or protect you or in any way like, you know, you can have a contract that guarantees and stipulates complete artistic control and freedom. But when it comes down to it, unless you're going to enter into like a glass bubble, then when you record that album, like if you're working with other people, other people are going to want to interject their inner, their opinions. They're going to want to feel involved too. And it will behoove you to involve them if you want them to work on your record and have it be successful. Because what kind of jerk is like, you should have no say in anything I'm doing right now. This is all <laughs> about me. And then you should go out and work and make me a star. Like, and we'll make money. Like, that's terrible. <laughs> um, that's just a terrible attitude. So, you know, we went through our third album experience where, we stayed with our indie. We didn't sign a contract. So in theory, we have complete creative control and we made the record we wanted to make and handed it in. And they're like, we don't like it. We want <laughs> you to change the track listing. We don't like the artwork. You should make the name bigger on the cover. And they told us their opinions. And there was no contractual reason why we should have to listen to any of those things. But there's the social pressure reason of, of why you should listen to those things. And so then you know, then you have a, a major label come to you who are like, we're going to give you an unfathomable amount of money. And we're going to give you a contract that actually says you have artistic freedom. And then you just know that you're still going to have those same social pressures of that you're choosing to work with somebody, you're choosing to have a work relationship with them, and they're going to interject your opinion. But you know, like I remember specifically, specifically this moment with our A&R person um, coming into the studio when we were with Butch, and they're like, hey, okay, so I've got these lyric ideas for you. Something oh like, boy. I'm running, I'm jumping, I'm singing, I'm dancing, I'm running, I'm jumping. And like <laughs> me and the band are sitting there looking in absolute horror at the A&R person telling us this, <laughs> like crumbling inside, you wow. know, like we're 26 years old. This is like a, an A&R person in their like late forties who's super experienced, you know, like, and they have the power of the company behind them. And Bush is very calmly sitting there and he's like, uh-huh, okay, that's interesting. We'll try that. And our person, <laughs> and our person leaves and Butch is like, we're not trying that. That's terrible. And we're like, oh, thank God. You know, but if we would have tried to have said the same, like if we would have tried to navigate that situation alone, we would have either been young punks and conversational about it and been like, F you, or we would have like, we would have caved to it and we would have had a record with those lyrics on it. So that that's an example of the buffer, you know? <laughs> I do think you should record I'm running, I'm jumping, I'm singing, I'm dancing for like an EP down the down the line. It's not even an exaggeration. Those were the little lyrics that they <laughs> suggested. It's so, insane. And and it was for the song Born on the FM Waves of the Heart. But anyways, go on. <laughs> A bunch more with Laura Jane Grace coming up. After the break, what made her want to record a solo record now? And what was it like creating it in quarantine? It's Bullseye for MaximumFun.org and NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor Miami Book Fair 2020. Your favorite fiction and nonfiction authors and poets are just a click away. Starting November 15th, Miami Book Fair will be online and on demand from anywhere you want to be. Get access to authors and poets discussing new books, including Walter Mosley, Ann Patchett, P.J. O'Rourke, Nicole Krauss, and 300 more. For adults, teenagers, and kids. Streaming starts November 15th, free. Get started. Visit MiamiBookFairOnline.com. I can't hear are you myself, myself, but I'm assuming that... These are real podcast listeners, not actors. And Hey, thanks for coming. Here's a list of descriptors. What would you choose to describe the perfect podcast? I mean, vulgarity. Dumb. Definitely dumb. And like, uh, right here, this one, meritless. 
what if I told you there was a podcast that did have all of that? No. Jordan Jesse Go. And it's free. Jordan Jesse Go? Jordan Jesse Go. Jordan Jesse Go. A real podcast. On the next episode of Louder Than a Riot, Bobby Schmerder's transition from the streets to superstardom and how viral fame led to infamy. I don't ask people from the hood if they got criminal activity going on. I know in hip hop, the better, the better. Listen now to Louder Than a Riot from NPR Music. You're listening to Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. If you're just joining us, our guest is the musician Laura Jane Grace. Laura fronts the punk band Against Me, but she also just released a solo record. It's called Stay Alive. It's out now. She's being interviewed by my pal Jordan Morris. Let's get back into it. Your album, Transgender Dysphoria Blues, I've heard it described as a concept album about a transgendered sex worker. I wanted to talk about this character and just hear from you who they are and why you wanted to write an album about them. When I was first starting to work on Transgender Dysphoria Blues, I started working on it with the band before I came out to the band as being transgender. So in writing these songs that were very obvious, you know, like having a song that has a chorus of does God bless your transsexual heart, you know, when you're playing in a band with a bunch of people who are not transgender or queer there, you know, that I, I knew that they were going to be like, uh, so what, what are you talking about here? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so I kind of started talking about it in that way to create a front and to try and push it off of me of like, oh, well, this isn't about me. I've, I'm, I'm trying to make a concept album and it's going to be a story about this, this sex worker or something like that. And, you know, it didn't work in that context, like trying to fictionalize it and make a story out of it was it, it, it just felt wrong. And it would, you know, it caused misconnection between me and the band. And it wasn't till I just came out and said, like, um, you know, actually, this is this is just about me. I'm transgender and I'm going to be transitioning, you know, that I really like hit the the stride within the album even or just like personally of, you know, this is obviously feels right. Um, so that that was kind of that was a front, you know. All dressed up and nowhere to go. Walking the streets all alone. Another night to wish that you could forget. Making you I'm curious about being a publicly trans person in 2020. Um, is it any different than, you know, when you when you first decided to come out? Well, yeah, <laughs> it's very different than <laughs> when I first <laughs> decided to come out. It's, it's strange to think about, too. It's sad to think about, too, um, where coming out, and I came out in 2012. At the time, there was, like, just this undercurrent that I... I felt of like, it wasn't just like by myself. I was like, I'm going to come out. This is what I'm going to do right now. I, I really like felt it around me with other people coming out, whether that was like my friend, Mina Caputo. I remember reading about her coming out and like those little bits of like, it's like a trail you're following. And, and every time you see someone else come out and accept themselves, it empowers you to accept yourself and be who you are. And, and it kind of all, it, you know, I mean, it was on the cover of Time magazine, like a year or two later, the transgender tipping point. And that, that was a real thing. You know, it was like all this cumulative energy that came together in a way where it was like, it felt like safer. It felt like there was hope and it felt like that this, oh, this is realistic. Like I could come out right now and I could be I could be happy. I could just like be accepted in the world and, you know, not ridiculed and, and, uh, and just like, uh, maybe there's a room for me in society to like have rights. Whereas now so much of that seems in question and uncertain, and it just seems so much scarier. 
I mean, even, you know, I look at like, uh, when was it in 2015 or 16, where like the Obama administration, you know, came out and they were like, transgender people, we see you, we recognize you, we have your backs. Like that was just a crazy moment to experience, you know, to feel like recognized by your government as legitimate and that you would maybe be protected somehow. Whereas now it's like this worry of like, am I going to be able to continue to have access to hormones? Do I need to, how do I approach that? Or like, when are they going to like totally screw me over with healthcare? Like just all these very real fears that, you know, again, I feel pretty naive about because these are fears that transgender people or queer people have, have, you know, dealt with throughout history. There's an Against Me album called Shapeshift With Me, which is a lot of uh, love songs, but they are love songs that involve plane crashes and uh, body horror. I wanted you to talk a little bit more about how Against Me approaches writing a love song. You know, I don't know. I guess like that at the time I was kind of obsessed with that idea of just wanting to write love songs And maybe it was because like in a way I needed to simplify things in my head and I was tired of thinking of bigger ideas. And also I was trying to shy away from the pressure of like, you know, the record prior to that was Transgender Dysphoria Blues. And I unfortunately, for better or worse, have this like natural inclination where when something is expected of me, I don't want to do it. So like being having a record like Transgender Dysphoria Blues, which directly with the transgender experience to then feel like there was an expectation to follow that up with another record directly about the transgender experience, that rebellious nature in me was just like, I just want to write love songs. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that's, that's all I was into doing for a period of time. And, and, um, and also kind of like realizing that there's just so much music out there that is that, you know, like that, that's like such a universal topic, but that it's not a topic that's like, necessarily sung about by transgender people and transgender people being so historically fetishized and um, kind of like seen as unlovable in, in so many ways. Like I wanted to present myself in that way, you know, to examine it, the, that feeling from a transgender perspective, you know, of like, is the only way a love song will connect on the radio is if it's sung by like a, a cisgendered person and, and why? I want to talk a little bit about the uh, new solo record, Stay Alive. I read that these songs on this record were not originally written to be a solo record. I wanted to know about the original plans for them and why you decided to record them like this. Well, I I had started off the year thinking that I'd be doing an Against Me record this year. And, uh, you know, I put out a record in 2018 called Bot to Rot on a label here in Chicago, Bloodshot Records. And I spent uh, most of 2018, 2019 touring on that. And then Against Me had been playing shows through 2019 too. And we had been, you know, I'd been writing songs during that whole time and we had been, we'd, we'd been working on them. And then started this year, we spent a week together in the studio in January, a week together in the studio in February, a week together in the studio in March. I played the Bernie Sanders rally in Lansing, Michigan. And then we headed out on what was supposed to be a three week long tour. We got three days into the tour and we had to cancel. We had to go home. That was when the pandemic hit. So it became really clear once we all got home and none of us, you know, none of us live in the same city. None of us live in the same state. So it became really clear once we were home that, you know, tour by tour, we were having to cancel the year and all of our plans were falling apart and that there was no real way to continue on working on a record um, because we just couldn't get into a room. So at the time, you know, I had like a good 30, 35 songs and we still weren't in a place where it was like, all right, we're ready to record. We know what the record is. We were still writing and working on it. So it's not like, 
you know, that these exact 14 songs just would have been the exact against me record. It's very realistic. There would have been one or two songs maybe on that. And the rest of them would have been totally different songs or, you know, even newly written or of the other like 15 plus that I I still have that I I'm sitting on, you know, but with this being kind of open-ended and not knowing like, okay, so are we going to get together again in a year or two years? And if it's like two years, is it going to be like, hey, hey, everybody, remember those 35 songs that we were working on two <laughs> years ago that we weren't really gelling with? But uh, hey, let's jump right back into those, right? Like that didn't seem like it was going to be anything anybody wanted to do. And I took a look at the songs that I had and I just was like, you know what? I think there's just like a record here already. And specifically also with choosing the songs I did, it was like, you know, there's, there's some songs here that maybe they weren't working in the full band context, but I like them. They make me happy. They make me happy to sit in my bathroom. It has the best acoustics in my apartment to sit in my (laughs) bathroom and to play them on my acoustic guitar and to sing them. I like them. So in almost a selfish way in that, in that sense, I was just like, I just want to record them. I want to record an album because it'll give me something to do. And it feels productive and it feels right to be productive. All I'm doing every day is waking up, turning on the news and seeing reports of, you know, of job loss, of, of people being unable to pay their rent. Um, I'm hearing from my friends about venues closing down, about the music industry just in total collapse. So the idea of like, OK, yeah, on the one side, I am a touring musician. That's what I do. But on the other side, like I'm also a songwriter and I'm a recording musician and I can't tour right now but I can record, I can continue to write songs. So if I can do that, and all I have to do in order to do that is to adjust my parameters, adjust my scope and and realize my limitations of, I can't do it with my band because they're not here. I have to do it in Chicago because that's where I live. I can only play and sing guitar. That's all I can do. So I can still make a record like that. So I just did that and I, you know, I, and I booked time. Don't make any promises Oh friend, I'm losing my mind Watching the days burn into years Watching the years burn dry Please stay alive Please stay alive Please stay alive Please serve I want to finish our conversation by talking about the uh, last song on the new record. Um, it's where the title comes from. It's called Old Friend, parentheses, Stay Alive. And I don't know, this is just a really beautiful song that I've been playing around my house a lot the past couple weeks. And I just kind of wanted to hear about it. Where did it come from? And why is that phrase, stay alive, something you wanted to put on the cover of the album? This was actually the very first song out of any of the songs on the record that was written. And I wrote this song probably end of 2017, beginning of 2018. And I have my friend Patrick, who is an old friend from Gainesville. I, you know, P- Patrick played in bands for years that Against Me toured with, and, and we were both friends in Gainesville. And then we both moved away from Gainesville. And I fell out of touch with him for a number of years. But at the time, I had gotten back into contact with him. And we just kind of, uh, we would text every day and just talk about what was going on. They were like re- living in a really isolated place. I was really isolated, feeling at least emotionally, and we were identifying with each other. And it was stark to me, feeling the years between us, feeling the way things had changed, being able to like really directly feel like still a connection to like, hey, remember that tour we took in, in July of 2001 or two? And it was a summer tour and, I, you know, I can, I can remember your jean shorts and I can remember the feeling of, of swimming in a stream in Montana. I can remember, you know, jumping on the roof of the vans when we were stuck in traffic in Iowa. I can remember uh, trying to get over this one pass in the Rocky Mountains, like all just like these really direct memories and then feeling that gulf of time between us and not understanding how far, how we had drifted so far away from the people that we used to be or how things had changed in just the ways they had changed to the people that were close between us who we lost along the way. And ultimately, like, 
when I boiled all the emotions down, there was just that feeling of like, I just want them to stay alive. I like, you know, I know that they may be having a hard time and maybe that's even selfish, but like, if you stay alive, then I'll stay alive, you know, like, and I just want you to stay alive. I, I want you to selfishly stay alive, even if it doesn't have anything to do, even if who we are now doesn't have anything to do with who we were, just because of that connection to it, you know, and that was the feeling behind writing the song at the time. And then as you know, as the, the years progressed, and as we got to where we are now, it just like resonated more and more of, of, of in wanting to kind of like, boil down the simplest message, you know, like just the, the, like, what is the most important thing right now, you know? And, and you kind of like would hear about that even more. So at the start of the pandemic of like, um, of like, you know, go easy on yourself. If you're not accomplishing that much right now, you know, what's important is like that type of line of thinking. And, and all that's important is like, just stay alive, just stay alive. You can, you can kind of screw things up right now, whatever, that's fine. Just stay alive. You know, maybe you're not being as productive as you could just stay alive. Well, Laura Jane Grace, thank you so much for this great conversation and for being perhaps the first person ever to mention uh, Less Than Jake on NPR. I, I thank you for both those things. <laughs> My pleasure. I, I like to break new ground. <laughs> Laura Jane Grace. Her new album is called Stay Alive. You can buy her record on her Bandcamp page, where you can also stream it. Give it a listen. I'm a regular Bandcamp user. Love Bandcamp. Special thanks to Jordan Morris, who conducted the interview. He's a comedy writer and creator of the Maximum Fun podcast, Bubble, which is going to be available soon as a graphic novel. It's available for pre-order now. He's also the co-host of Jordan, Jesse Go, and... One of the top 10 most punk rock Maximum Fun hosts. In fact, top five. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is created out of the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around greater Los Angeles, California, where another round of refrigerator semi-failure has led me to question my role in the domestic drama that is life in the Thorn Home. I'm thinking about a, whether to get a, a French door style or a side-by-side -side style refrigerator. Neither of them will fit in the hole in my cabinets where a refrigerator goes, though. We might put the portable dishwasher there. Also, apparently you can't buy refrigerators right now. I don't know. Our show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio and Jordan Cowling are our associate producers. We get help from Casey O'Brien and Kristen Bennett. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. Our theme song is by the band The Go Team. Thanks to them and to their label, Memphis Industries, for sharing it. Great band, great music. Go, go get some. It's probably on Bandcamp. If you want to hear the latest about what we're up to, you can keep up with the show on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We post our interviews there. And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.